Hello everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we will listen to the seventh part of the memoirs of German Colonel Steidel Lewitpold, regimental commander of Paulus's 6th Army. In February 1945, I completed my activities at the front in Namslaw and returned to the seat of the National Committee, Lunivo. The first two weeks were spent analysing the work done, writing reports, preparing radio speeches and articles for our newspaper. After that, I finally found time to ask what's new, to be with old friends again, with Gunther van Hooven, Erich Weinert, Alfred Corella, and to meet the Wehrmacht clergymen I knew above all Joseph Kaiser and Father Ludwig. I had been at the front for ten months without a break. My thirst for information was as strong as my need to share my impressions. I wanted to know the status of the Christian liaison working group that had been set up during my stay at the front. I knew some facts from the newspaper and leaflets, but it remained unclear in what atmosphere the activities of this group were unfolding. Did it not represent a church cathedral in miniature? How did the cooperation with the National Committee proceed? Such facts as the participation of clergymen of both denominations in the activities of the National Committee, their appearances on the radio, and the reports they made in the POW camps were widely echoed among the POWs. They were especially impressed, of course, by the fact that the priests performed divine services, also on the Moscow radio. They also fulfilled their duty as clergymen. Joseph Kaiser was undoubtedly one of the Wehrmacht's most popular Catholic priests. A mining engineer by training, he took up the study of theology rather late, at the age of 30, and became a parish priest in Sauerland. Impressed by the poverty and distress of the miners' families and his own clashes with mine owners, he came to understand the class struggle and became interested in social and political issues. Speaking in defence of the miners, he found himself in conflict with his church superiors. He himself told us about this, and we learned from the soldiers that he was equally fearless in opposing the SS and Sonderführer when they tried to go on a rampage in his in the cauldron at Stalingrad near Vertiechi. With pectoral cross in hand, he handed over his ward of severely wounded soldiers to the first Soviet commandant with the following words. Please help, I am a priest. I remember well how Father Kaiser, talking with us, expressed his thoughts about the future of post-war Germany. He envisioned the prospect of a Christian state community like the medieval class state. Peter Ludwig was more sober in his assessment of the situation. He took into account in his conceptions the irreversible changes that had taken place since the First World War. Not he pointed out the need to take into account the existence of both Christian denominations and the differences between their views. At the end of 1943, I also had to talk to evangelical priests. Pastor Johannes Schroeder, Pastor Nikolaus Zenixen, Pastor Karl Pagel, as well as the divisional chaplain of the 208th Infantry Division and the present bishop in Greifswald, Dr. Friedrich Wilhelm Kramacher. By discussing the problems that occupied us, we eventually clarified our own positions. Meetings with clergymen of the Russian Orthodox Church helped us a lot. We knew that the Russian Orthodox Church morally and materially supported the struggle of the Soviet peoples against the invaders. We knew that it instructed and preached in an atheistic environment. In all this, we saw confirmation of the correctness of the path we had chosen, regardless of differences in the way of thinking, faith and worldview, to jointly destroy the common enemy, fascism. On June 16, 1944, on the initiative of pastors Joseph Kaiser and Johannes Schroeder, a meeting was held, which culminated in the founding of a working group on church matters. Many clergymen, theology students and lay people participated in this meeting. A few days later, I was working at the front at the time and therefore could not participate in the meeting. We also received the first proclamation of the working group and the minutes of the meeting. The proclamation and the minutes testify that in this time of sorrow for the whole world, Christians were seeking solutions to the most important issues with a sense of high responsibility, honestly and seriously, acting in a spirit of deep religiosity and peacefulness. Understandably, the relationship between the churches and the state in the past and the position of the churches toward the new Germany have been debated many times. Erich Wienert, chairman of the National Committee, said on this occasion in his report, Our task is to show the German people how the national struggle for our freedom and our honour should be waged with the participation of the entire people without distinction of political and religious views. In the concentration camps of the Third Empire, a worker and a clergyman, a Christian and a non-Christian languish and suffer side by side. 
but the long years of shared hardship brought people closer together, and these ties will continue to exist even after the liquidation of the power of terror. Thus, a foundation has been laid that will serve as a strong foundation for our future democracy. When the persecuted church defends itself against hostile attacks and harassment by people who deify Hitler, it is a just war which meets with the full sympathy of non-believing anti-fascists. Moreover, they regard the Ecclesia militants as their allies and comrades in arms in the struggle for freedom. We are therefore deeply convinced that this militant fellowship will appear in the future Germany as an indissoluble alliance built on mutual respect. That part of the German people which professes the Christian religion and belongs to its churches would like to see clarity brought to the question of what position the church will occupy in a democratic Germany and what rights and privileges it will be granted. I can answer you in the name of the National Committee and say that we firmly adhere to the principles of our manifesto, which provides for the restoration and extension of the political rights and social gains of the workers, freedom of speech, of the press, of organizations, of conscience and of religion. We consider these rights sacred and inviolable. But such a true democracy, in which all these rights and privileges are realized and secured, can only become a reality if our people themselves win this democracy. Nations have never before received freedom and rights as a gift from heaven. But it is also unacceptable that one part of the people struggles to obtain rights for another part of the people and presents them to it as a gift. It follows from this that the church will also face the question whether it is only making demands for future rights without already taking a clear position, or whether it will be able to justify its right to religious freedom through its participation in the struggle on the side of the whole nation. Only in this way can the prerequisites for a democratic state, realizing the will of the people, protect church institutions and the freedom of their religious activities from attacks and persecution be created. But in the event that the church were to oppose itself to the popular movement against Hitler, it would not have to expect that it would receive the guarantees it desires. At the same time, the evangelical pastor Johannes Schroeder, in his closing remarks, outlined the position of the clergy toward the National Committee as follows. We do not call upon you to participate in political adventures, but to serve the German people with Christian good deeds in this time of need. We call for cooperation, for the unification of all those who, with a pure heart and clean hands, strive to help Germany. But it is in our movement, in the Free Germany movement, that such hearts and forces are united. And in this connection I want to refer once again to the statements of Mr. Chairman Eric Winnett, to which I attach great importance. We all know that in millions of German hearts there is not a trace of trust in Hitler left. We know that millions of Germans fight, work and die in Hitler's war only because they are terrified at the thought of the vacuum that will come after Hitler's fall. They ask themselves the question in fear. What will come after Hitler? They are indoctrinated daily by National Socialist propaganda that after Hitler's downfall there will be chaos, doom, the end of Western culture. In this mass of lies your words, Mr. Chairman Weinert, have pierced a hole. You have predetermined the way to the solution of the far from simple problem of the relationship between the state and the church. At the end of the meetings a working group on church matters was established. Catholic priests Kaiser, Ludwig and Moore Evangelical priests Schroeder, Zenickson and Dr. Kramacher participated in its work as representatives of church circle. We know that the formation of the working group and its proclamation became known to the authoritative Catholic authorities in Germany during the Nazi war. Unfortunately, at that time, the highest Catholic authorities did not have the courage to inform the general public. However, it was already clear to us then that the fundamental rights enshrined in our manifesto would form an integral part of the future constitution of a free Germany. The principles which served as a basis for cooperation between people of different backgrounds and world views in the activities of the National Committee became the foundation of the first peaceful state in German history, which we are all working together to build, defend and promote. The National Committee is winding up its activities. After the unconditional surrender of the Nazi state, we from Lunev followed the post-war events in Germany with a truly burning anxiety and deep involvement. Many of us only now realized what grandiose, daring decisions, what comprehensive, abrupt changes were connected from the very beginning with the work of the National Committee Free German. The goal of the anti-fascist front should be not only the overthrow of Hitler and the fascist system, but also the creation of a new basis of social life for the entire German people and the German state. 
Only a democratic anti-fascist system could realize these aspirations, and we understood that the word anti-fascist was a concept that encompassed everything that had been formed, and realized in these years in the activities of the National Committee, and everything that had proved real and necessary in the resistance movement against Hitler in Germany. I mean the broad cooperation based on mutual trust for the common goal of Marxists and Christians, proletarians and bourgeois intellectuals. In this spirit acted our friends in the Elbricht group, on whom in the first hour of liberation a great responsibility fell. In the same spirit, the new parties also built their program. We call upon you to forget what has divided the Germans. Follow our call for a great party which is ready to cooperate with the other parties of the new democracy for the revival of Germany. Read the founding proclamation of the Christian Democratic Union, with which I felt bound as a member of the Catholic movement. The entire democratic bloc in which the newly formed parties, the German Communist Party, the German Social Democratic Party, and the Liberal Democratic Party, united on July 14, spoke in the same spirit. Then came the momentous day of August 2, when the nations of the anti-Hitler coalition signed the Potsdam Accords. We felt a sense of deep satisfaction that the principles of building a peace-loving Germany, which we had formulated in the manifesto of the National Committee, the German anti-Hitler coalition, had been put into international legal form. Our demands were as follows. A strong democratic government which will have nothing to do with the impotence of the Weimar regime. A democracy which will ruthlessly, fundamentally suppress any attempt at any new conspiracies against the rights of the people or against European peace. The complete abolition of all laws based on national or racial hatred of all orders of Hitler's regime that humiliate our people. The abolition of all measures of Hitler's power directed against freedom and human dignity restoration and expansion of the political rights and social gains of the workers, freedom of speech, press, organizations, conscience and religion, the immediate release of the victims of Hitler's terror and material compensation for the damage caused to them, a just, merciless trial of the perpetrators of the war, of its instigators, of their behind-the-scenes instigators. All this was enshrined in the Potsdam Accords. Of course, there were also sharp disagreements among us, First of all, on the question of the German Eastern Bloc, not everyone was able to draw the proper conclusions from the fact that German militarism had twice taken its eastern neighbour in the pincers, formed by Silesia and East Prussia, and therefore these pincers had to be eliminated once and for all. The policy of compensation for losses had to be implemented in practice and not limited to declamation. However, those former prisoners of war who are still in captivity and especially those who, when given the opportunity to return home, cynically betrayed the aims of the National Committee, are now spreading malicious slander when they claim that the events of May 8 and August 2 caused despair, despondency and apathy in the German Officers' Union. The National Committee and the German Officers' Union have for many months of their work constantly warned that the struggle against Hitler cannot be suspended with the onset of Germany's inevitable defeat. We have invariably called for contrasting the Nazi war with the popular struggle against Hitler. We, the frontline plenipotentiaries, but not only we, knew how difficult it was to bring about a turning point and to induce the Germans to embark on a new path. How many letters and appeals we sent to generals and commanders, and how small was the actual outcome compared to the expected results. But that is why we appealed again and again to the soldiers and line officers, urging them to stop the senseless struggle to save their lives for a better Germany. Live to save not one but many dis. We succeeded in doing. And now it was proper both here in the prisoner of war camps and there, in the ruins of German cities, to involve the survivors in the work of building a new Germany. That was our task now. Apathy, despair, Perhaps those officers who from the beginning had interpreted the manifesto of the National Committee in their own way, as I had seen in the creation of the German Officers' Union, might have fallen into such a state. Those who did not want a break with Hitler to lead to a break with the ruinous legacy of Germany's past, with militarism, with the claim to world domination, might have been disappointed. They saw in the departure from Hitler merely a break with a man who had proved unsuitable for the realization of the aims of German militarism. And for us, everything we did after Germany's liberation from fascism was a consistent continuation of what we had done before. We closely followed the developments in all the occupation zones of Germany, and it soon became clear to me that the tasks we had set in the National Committee were being truly realized in the Soviet occupation zone. 
In discussing the questions that arose, we tried, first of all, to clarify the general problem, how the work should unfold here in the National Committee and later in the homeland. So the decision to discuss this whole set of problems in the National Committee, as well as in the German officers' union matured. In the course of my work as a frontline commissioner, I was accustomed not to conceal my thoughts. I therefore presented my thoughts to Eric Wienert and Wolf Stern. Both agreed with me and, as yet, confided in me that the time had apparently come to complete the activities of the National Committee. The educational work in the camps should be continued, as well as the political courses. However, it must be realized that the most difficult task awaits us at home. On November 2, 1945, a plenary meeting of the National Committee with the German Officers' Union took place. Erich Weinert again outlined the tasks and development of the National Committee's activities, praised the merits of its members and honoured the memory of the soldiers who had given their lives in this struggle. Only these soldiers died in the name of Germany. One of the most important tasks of the National Committee was to awaken in the whole nation the spirit of militant democracy, which had previously been characteristic only of the vanguard of the working class and the progressive intelligentsia. Only by acting in the same spirit can the traditional prejudices in the most diverse strata of our people be overcome, and all truly freedom-loving Germans who seek justice will be united in a common fighting front. The developments in Germany already now make it possible to see the outlines of the new Germany which we have outlined in our manifesto, and the leaders of the Free Germany movement can credit themselves with having taken this new path before other Germans with conviction. Erich Winnert ended his speech with the following words. Remaining confident that the ideals which inspired us in our work have now become a creative beginning in the life of the broad masses of our people. The National Committee can consider its work completed. The National Committee was the first step toward the free democratic unification of the Germans. It has fulfilled its task. The ideas which guided it from its very foundation have become a vital force in our homeland. When all honest Germans embrace these ideas with the same passion with which we have supported and developed them, our nation will be able to stand before the world again. After Erich Wienert made his report, General von Seidlitz, in his capacity as president of the German Officers' Union, spoke. As a soldier, he called for the promotion of reparations and the revival of Germany. He emphasized that the rebuilding of our homeland and the reparation of losses to the affected countries are two processes closely related. In conclusion, we unanimously decided to terminate the activities of the National Committee and the German Officers' Union. Moscow, December 8, 1945. Flight to the homeland. I once again walked along Gorky Street to get as many impressions as possible while observing the morning bustle and looked into the small church where two years ago I stood with Hans Mail in front of the iconostasis with countless burning candles. Walking along the street, one could, as two years ago, see what was being done behind the windows on the first floor if the light was on in the room. There was still a lack of curtains and drapes. Somewhere in the squares, thousands of stacks of firewood were stacked and distributed there. Countless cars, already completely worn out, were moving along the streets. At times a streetcar showed up, creaking and jerking at the turns. Shrouded people in high, simple felt boots were walking. Well, cheerful children with briefcases in their hands or with satchels over their shoulders were running by. Women in white coats offered their goods to passers hot tea, bread and sausage. During the last hours of our stay in Moscow, we, having met in the House of the National Committee on our bat, talked about many things, said goodbye to our Soviet friends, although we did not really believe that the date would take place. After all, our homeland was far at a distance of 2,000 kilometers. Having involuntarily thought about it, we all somehow became quiet. We were going home. It meant the beginning of a new life, a two-engine mail airplane took us to Berlin. Along with me flew Father Joseph Kaiser, Pastor Johannes Schroeder, Comrades Leonard Helm Schrott and Matthias Klein. Before leaving, we received our civilian clothes and folded our uniforms in one knot. I also had a sleeping bag with me, in which I packed papers, notes, documents, drawings that had accumulated over the past two and a half years. About 4 p.m., we landed at berlin Johannesville. A few minutes later, we were already sitting together with Walter Ulbricht in a small office. It was Saturday, December 8. During this cordial meeting, Walter Ulbricht confirmed what I had already been informed in Moscow. The General Directorate of Agriculture and Forestry, headed by Edwin Gernel, 
had already been expecting my arrival for two months. As one of the vice chairmen, I was to take charge of the work in the field of animal husbandry. Walter Ulbritt gave us complete freedom of choice and offered us his assistance if we wanted to participate in the rebuilding of the country at another point in Germany. A few days later, Pastor Schroeder left for Neumünster in Schleswig-Holstein. Father Joseph Kaiser wished to look around Berlin first and then return to his homeland in Westphalia. We spent Sunday afternoon renewing old contacts and making new ones. We visited the priest at the Catholic hospital on Niederwallstrasse with whom Father Kaiser was acquainted, and there in the chapel on Sunday morning Joseph Kaiser served early mass for the first time again on German soil. Then we went to Cardinal Count Prissing, to Dr. Erms, and to the House of the Catholic Women's Union at Lixensee. From there my greetings to my relatives were conveyed to Munich through the telephone operator at the American Telephone Exchange. Thus my family received the first news of my safe return. While still in lieu I came to the firm decision that I would continue my activity in favour of peace-loving Germany in the same place where I had begun it. In line with friends from the National Committee, with Marxists and anti-fascists from the bourgeois milieu, together with all those who are ready to follow the new path. The beginning of a new life and the return to my homeland were inseparable. For all these years, the hope for a better future for my people had possessed me, as much as the anxiety about the fate of my family, who had been threatened with house arrest since the summer of 1944. My family sympathised with the fact that I joined the National Committee and decided to fight together with it against fascism for a free Germany. But in the following years it was unable to understand my further steps. I decided not to return to Munich. I stayed here in Berlin of my own free will, because I did not want to renounce everything I had learned and done after Stalingrad. My first marriage broke up precisely because of this lack of understanding of the new worldview, which took me on a different path and transformed me. Modern labour, a sense of community with other people, the consciousness of the responsibility entrusted to me, all this gave meaning to my life. But I could not be deceived. I had returned home, and yet I was not yet home. In the building on Ringengardstrasse, where the General Directorate of Agriculture and Forestry was then located, I met Ganner Clausen among my employees, and my life was like that of many Germans. A happy marriage, then the death of her husband at the front, years of fruitless waiting in the hope that the sad news will be a mistake, tireless care for her sister and her little daughter. But despite everything, not a shadow of despondency, Ganner Clausen was not broken by the burden of a difficult past. She went to work. Her understanding, insight and intelligence allowed her to explore a new field. She was passionate about her work, a valuable employee, attentive to people, always ready to help them, using her vast experience. She grew up in a humble family of artisans. Having lost her mother, she became independent at an early age and successfully improved her professional qualifications, because she was keenly interested in everything that could contribute to her education and general development. In her person I met a person who not only sympathised with my desire to start a new life, but was ready to walk with me on this path. After a few years, my first marriage was dissolved, having made sure of the strength of our feelings over the years. We married in 1954 and created a new family home. It was she who tried in every way possible to mend the relationship between me and my children and relatives, who initially regarded my evolution with reticence and not without prejudice. And so tonight I am sitting late at night in our home, as I often do, sinking through all the experiences of the past decade. The bitter minor clock chimes softly. Its chime is echoed by another antique clock that I brought back to life here in this house. When I look up, my eyes are drawn to the ghostly outline of the ship's tackle on the wall, and I dream of weeks of vacation at the seaside. On the shelf next to the desk are the theatre programmes my wife has collected since the drama of 1945. I recall our experiences with her, our arguments at home and at meetings with actors and artists, and again I look at a watercolour, my work executed during the summer months. The Biedermeier style dominated the years 1819-1850 in Germany and Austria. Behind the wall I can hear the clatter of a typewriter. My wife is probably still proofreading or sorting out the urgent correspondence that has come to us. There, beyond the wall of her domain, is a world of books of value to us, fiction which is a very important element in our lives, for my books are mainly concerned with social, political and historical problems. My thoughts turn to the past, to what has been experienced, 
to what has been thought through, and my memory goes back to December 1945, when I was sitting in the office of Edwin Gernel in Ringerstrasse, who then immediately devoted a lot of time to a long and detailed conversation about my future activities. It was a question of agrarian reform, which was being increasingly sabotaged by political opponents, of measures to provide food for the population, of restoring a healthy livestock. The most important task was to take the initiative and power into my own hands to insist on my own in dealing with the stubborn landowners, because only by acting on a zone-wide scale could success be achieved. Herney again displayed his inherent qualities, his ability to determine precisely which primary task to undertake, distinguishing it from other, also important tasks, for which, however, the prerequisites were not yet sufficient. He coped brilliantly with practical work, contrary to the impression we had in Lunev that he was mainly a major agrarian theoretician. Just as in Lunev, he responded vividly to the comments and suggestions of the interlocutor, prompting further reflection. Conversations with him were interesting and fruitful. They awakened thought, Gurney strove for people to show independence, boldly put forward new ideas. From the very beginning, it was clear to me that an environment was being created that would stimulate our work together. When land reform was proclaimed, I immediately suggested that on one of my first trips around the country I should visit, as soon as convenient, Campbell, the estate where Princess Blucher had once ruled, and where my first plans for land reform had shamefully failed. It would be good to see on the spot what changes have now come to Campbell. For me, these changes would have a symbolic meaning. By them we could judge the direction of our path. Yes, yes, they answered me but go also to those villages where difficulties have arisen and still exist in the land reform. There is obviously a clique of junkers, a former burgomaster or culex. Maybe, I think it is quite probable. The resistance is being encouraged from somewhere outside. Yes, but it's not only that. Sometimes the agricultural workers at first refused to divide the land of the junkers among themselves. But even there now, the land reform has been carried out. In six months, people will become more conscious, and then they will move even further forward. In a year, in five years? What I was told did not come as a surprise to me. Our work at the front in the prisoner of war camps was of the same nature, and at that time, too, we should not indulge in illusions. During our last conversation in Lviv, a rich Wienert said to me, the most difficult work we still have to do, the work in the homeland, this work required from us, besides clarity of thought, also patience, strength of conviction, and a constant readiness to group people in the right positions. As we travelled through the villages, we met Gertrude Habersartz and Lysol Hulks, Felix Janus, a peasant from Krask, and perhaps even Wanschkitrelel. All those people whom I later met again in the works of the writers Helmut Zakowski, Benno Felkner, Yuri Brezen, and Erwin Strittmatter. We fought everywhere, in every farm, to stop rabies, foot and mouth disease, and the spread of epizootics. Sometimes we had to pound our fist on the table at a meeting. When current needs were contrasted with the requirements for the future, when there were calls to divide the agricultural experimental estates and stud farms, in the name of the future, it was necessary to say decisively, no, we need the experimental breeding stations of German agricultural science. We need Dummersdorf, the island of Rome, we will need again the pasture lands of our stud farms in Neustadt, in Graditz, in Ferdinandshof and Riedefin. It was not easy for people to understand this at a time when every scrap of land, even green spaces in the cities, had to be used to supply the population with food. At that time it seemed to many people that the plan of work of draft power was more important than the plan of work of breeding breeds. However, it was enough to look at the diagrams made in our general directorate on the basis of the first statistical data to realize to what extent it was necessary, soberly assessing the heavy worries and needs of today, not to forget about tomorrow. A high column reflected the availability of draft power, bulls and cows. Next to it, a much more modest graphical representation of the number of horses, and then a very small column. The number of technical units, including the few repaired steam plows, unforgettable times. They laid the foundation for all that has become reality. The scope of our tremendous successes was predetermined in those times. In agriculture, 20,000 years is a short time, for it is only 20 harvests. Who among the peasants would dare to say that as a farmer he used each of these 20 harvests so effectively that he was able, thanks to his own experience, to achieve greater and greater success each time? 
No one can say this without being wrong. How can we avoid possible losses from insufficient agricultural productivity? Only by pooling the experience of many people. Joint planning exchange of experience, which takes into account both mistakes and achievements, a keen interest in science, all this is the key to success. We understand that in the end of each year we not only get new material values, crops, but also multiply the wealth of spiritual values as a result of labour activity in various special branches. After all, not only fruits of the earth, but also people grow and ripe. In the General Directorate of Agriculture, and later in the German Economic Commission, of which I was vice chairman, we had young employees working beside us, who at night fiercely made up for what they had been deprived of because of the war, or because of restrictions on access to education, or because of their stay in concentration camps. Older, experienced comrades in the profession worked beside us, but they also had to acquire new knowledge, that is when the time of learning began. It has never ended, for even today the desire for knowledge and further training is widespread in the GDDR. Many people no longer realize that this is an essential human trait in a country of socialism. It was a natural phenomenon. It could not have been otherwise. In those difficult years of the Reconstruction period, I was particularly impressed by the way the bourgeois scientists held on. They came to us, some for the sake of their science, others because they instinctively felt that after the lessons of fascism, it was no longer possible to remain aloof from the life of society. Some made their choice under the strong impression of the first weeks after the surrender. Thus, a member of our staff who came from Munchenberg once excitedly recounted, not only the Palace of San Susi was saved from wanton destruction, but also our institute. On the right and left military units moved past us, but even all the window panes remained intact. We could immediately resume work on the cultivation of grape fiends that were immune to phylloxera infestation. Among those who joined us at that time, there was a scientist who has always remained a model for me to follow. I am referring to Professor Mitch Schierlich, an outstanding scientist in the field of soil science. At the end of the war, at the most distressing time, he came with his wife, child and many collaborators from the East in search of a new homeland. He did not waste any time, but set about his work with vigour. He had to give his staff the opportunity to resume their profession and provide them with a livelihood. The most important task was to re-establish his scientific research work, which was also widely known outside Germany in the second phase of his life. He obtained the Paulinania estate from the alienated lands and began experiments there, which he then continued at the Institute for Agriculture at the German Academy of Agricultural Sciences. What the agricultural production cooperatives are now doing to improve the fertility of the soil is based primarily on the life's work of this scientist. In those months, Hitralich had only one thing on his mind. He tried to energetically conduct his work, to build, to give advice, to re-establish with Soviet specialists the close ties that had existed before the war. This side of his activity demands as high an appreciation as his merits in increasing the yield of our agriculture. The struggle for ideological clarity. I would, however, paint a wrong picture of that time if I were silent about the activities of others who had nothing to do with such men as Prof. Mischerlich in Porineno, Prof. Massimai in Berlin, Prof. Stabi in Gettersleben, Prof. Becker in Quedlinburg and my friend Prof. Hoffman in Gina. Very different people could be found everywhere, in scientific institutes and in the villages, in the ranks of the parties, and also in our headquarters. There turned out to be a former ministry official who had made illegal contact with the British and the Americans. There was also such an employee who had negotiated in Karlshorst with representatives of the Soviet military administration before lunchtime, and in the afternoon had informed the American liaison officer in Zeelendorf in detail about these negotiations. Some individuals were subjectively honest opponents of Hitler, but they did not understand the roots of fascism. They were waiting for salvation from an improved Weimar Republic. It did not require abandoning hostility to communism. Some pretended to be members of the resistance and hid their Nazi past under this guise. There were others who infiltrated the newly established democratic parties and tried to disorient the members and disorganize the work of the parties. They sought to undermine the trust between the parties, the willingness to cooperate between them, the mature understanding of the need for such cooperation. I got acquainted with one such figure even before I started working in the main department of agriculture and forestry. On the day after my return from Moscow, when, together with Father Joseph Kaiser, 
We visited acquaintances in the western sectors of Berlin. We also visited Andreas Hermes, who, we learned, had been elected on June 26, 1945, chairman of the Sea Dew in the Soviet occupation zone. Hermes probably thought that one of the Paulus officers, as he called me, who could also be a dangerous messenger of the Communist East, but he did not dare to include a Catholic pater in such a category of people. So at first we talked animatedly, freely, in a friendly tone. Hermes made no secret of his disagreement with the land reform. He thought that it has too revolutionary character. It is carried out rashly and, of course, not by specialists and some functionaries, mainly from the Communist Party, and they, of course, want to forcibly establish the Soviet order in our country. And in general, in no case should we dismember large agricultural enterprises. It would cause chaos in the food supply. He wanted to know what we think about it. Did you agree or undertake in the National Committee to pursue a certain line of agrarian policy? The meaning of these words was clear to me, so that I lost all desire to discuss with Hermes the tasks to be solved in my new field of activity. I confined myself to remarking that, according to my observations, the Soviet organs are, as a rule, well informed about the situation in Germany. But the most important thing, I added, was to carry out the decisions of the Potsdam Conference. Yes, yes, I heard in reply, that is very instructive. But you should definitely establish contacts with the heads of the agrarian department of the Sea Dew, Mr. Hummel, with Count Schmetto, and with von Zitzwitzmatrin. They will certainly give you valuable instructions. You need to understand well the situation in Germany, and besides you are a Bavarian and are not familiar with the conditions here in Prussia. During this meeting on December 8, Hermes concealed from me that the members of the Sea Dew did not agree with the position taken by him and Dr. Schreiber. The land associations and numerous local groups publicly protested against his attitude towards agrarian reform, and the new settlers enforced the Sea Dew General Directorate to recall Herms and Schreiber from their posts. Thus, the sabotage of the agrarian reform organized by some right wing figures in the leadership of the Sea Dew Party failed and was resisted. Alternatings with Otto Nuschke. In these days, perhaps it was before Christmas, I met Otto Nuschke, then head of the New Zeit Publishing House. For me, Otto Nuschke was a support in the tense atmosphere that prevailed in the Seedew building on the Jagerstrasse. What was remarkable about Nuschke was his kindness, his thoughtful, almost contemplative and balanced character, and especially his open, calm gaze and the clarity with which he clearly and honestly expressed his opinions were favourable to him. It was with such people that I always wanted to cooperate. On February 12, 1946, I joined the CDU. I tried to have frequent conversations with Otto Nuschke, and in this way I became close in a friendly atmosphere to a politician who had a great deal of parliamentary experience. Like all his listeners, including even his opponents, I always admired his ingenuity, skill and humour during discussions, and you could see how much he himself enjoyed finding a polished phrase or a witty word. It was Nuschke who put forward the slogan of the Christian Democratic Union, Ex Oriente. Ra Nuschke formulated this slogan at an early stage of the party's existence, when he gave free rein to his talent for improvisation when speaking at a lot. He led those who led the Christian Democratic Union along the clear path of friendly and trust-based cooperation with the Socialist United Party of Germany and other parties. This was the clear path to peace and socialism. No one made Nuschke the father and teacher of the Sidhu. He himself became it through his political activity and influence on his supporters. At the end of 1947, progressive members of the Sidhu headquarters and the state associations clustered around Nuschke, among them August Bach in Thuringia, Gerald Gotting in Saxony-Anhalt, Dr. Reingold Lebedens in Mecklenburg, Pastor Ludwig Kirsch in Saxony, Hans Paul Ganter Gilmans in Brandenburg, and Dr. Gerhard Deschik in Berlin. Meanwhile, Jakob Kaiser, Ernst Lemmer and Dr. Friedensberg again tried to reverse or suspend the process of social development in the then Soviet occupation zone, a process which was historically conditioned and necessary from a national point of view. They tried to explode the anti-fascist democratic united front. These reactionary politicians hoped to achieve their goals either by misleading with their political concepts of building bridges between East and West, or slogans of Christian socialism, or by creating false worldview alternatives, such as Christianity or Marxism, or finally by openly making reactionary demands. At this time, the Cold War began. 
Thus, the political crisis in the Sidhu was in direct connection with the global strategy of the imperialists, and the strategy of that time differed from the modern one only in its methods. But, we as a comparison with the past shows, it did not differ from the modern one in the nature of the slogans that were secretly disseminated or insistently proclaimed. The crisis in the Sidhu reached its highest point when, as a result of the intrigues of Kaiser and Lemma, an attempt was made to sabotage the first German People's Congress of Unity and Just Peace. The members of the Sidhu resolutely rejected such a decision. We took part in the People's Congress, spoke out during the discussion on vital questions of our people, elected delegates including Otto Nuschke and Dr. Reingold Lobedans. They were to represent the interests of our people at the Foreign Minister's Conference in London. The extent to which reaction overestimated its strength in the ranks of the Sidhu was revealed when I spoke in favour of the movement for the People's Congress, at which time the reactionaries tried to expel me from the Sidhu, but it did not even come to the point of discussing such a demand, because the initiators of this scheme defected to their instigators and patrons after Kaiser, Lemmer, Friedensburg and other reactionaries had lost their positions in the party. At the statutory Third Congress of the Sidhu in September 1948, Nuschke was elected chairman of the CDU. In the meantime, the movement for the People's Congress, which later formed the basis for the National Front for a Democratic Germany, had developed into a powerful action that united all honest Germans and drew on eight million citizens, as evidenced by the outcome of the elections for the Third German People's Congress in May 1949. This Congress took place three weeks after the adoption of the Bonn Constitution by the Parliamentary Council, and in September the West German separate state had already been formed. The Third German People's Congress approved the draft constitution of the German Democratic Republic drawn up by the German People's Council. On October 7, 1949, the People's Council was transformed into a provisional People's Chamber, adopted the constitution, and announced the establishment of a German peace-loving state, the German Democratic Republic. On October 10, Army General Chikov handed over to the provisional government all the functions that previously, according to the Potsdam Agreement, were the responsibility of the Soviet military administration. Then I was among those who participated in this solemn act with the greatest excitement, and we stood on the very spot where, on May 8, 1945, the defeated Nazi generals of the Wehrmacht signed the Act of Surrender. On October 11, 1949, at a joint meeting of the Provisional People's Chamber and the Provisional Land Chambers, then-President-elect Wilhelm Pieck assessed the events in a heartfelt speech. We can state with satisfaction that the struggle of the National Front, of all Germans for the unity of Germany and for a just peace, treaty has entered a new phase with the formation of the German Democratic Republic. To a greater extent than ever before, we can continue the struggle for our just cause with a firm hope of success. The German Democratic Republic is not alone. In its struggle for peace, unity and justice, it can rely on the friendship of the great, mighty Soviet Union, on friendship with all the countries of people's democracy, with all the forces of world peace. In October 1949, a new period began in my cooperation with Otto Nuschke. We both became members of the government, Otto Nuschke as Deputy Chairman of the Council of Ministers and I as Minister of Labour and Health building socialist health care. In the summer of 1968, in the course of my official duties, I once again welcomed one of the many congresses taking place in Weimar. Being among the participants of the German Therapeutic Congress, I thought, actually, how many conferences and meetings have I had to attend since 1945? How many were there, 600 or more? Were they two or three a month, not counting the talks and meetings along the way? Looking back over the years, I can say that I never had to hold conferences and meetings as often as I did between 1949 and 1958, when I was Minister of Health. I have this impression not because at that time one Congress followed another, one meeting followed another, but because all these conferences, meetings, final conversations in the hospital or at the Faculty of Medicine and meetings with different people inevitably took on the character of an ideological discussion, a struggle for each individual for his evolution, for his making the right decision. Of course, the new tasks that arose in 1949 were nothing like those that had to be solved in 1945. There was no longer any need to obtain horseshoes or horseshoe spikes or tools for cutting through bark beetle-infested forests in Thuringia. By comparison, 
It was now a question of establishing in our republic the production of penicillin and tuberculosis vaccine, of deploying in our laboratories the production of new drugs that could find sales on the world market. Now the task was to build more hospitals and to properly distribute them around the country. In the first place was the care of the human being, the sick to be healed, the healthy to be protected from disease, and the care of the doctor himself. Everything that was achieved at that time in the field of health care, as well as in all spheres of our life, in the economy, in culture, in science and in school work, was the result of innovation, the development of a new field of activity or the fruit of hard work, the purpose of which was to make up everything that was lost during the war or destroyed by the war. It was necessary to overcome the damage done to public health by the war and the post-war years, to eliminate epidemics, to fight, above all, against tuberculosis. It was necessary, with the help of the latest scientific discoveries and methods, to improve the health of the whole nation, and finally to put an end to the disastrous backwardness of healthcare in the countryside. All these tasks were equally important, and each of them could be successfully solved only in interdependence with the solution of other tasks. Consequently, we had to build new clinics and sanatoriums, expand the network of polyclinics and rural outpatient clinics, distributing them evenly throughout the country. Consequently, we had to have more doctors, and to improve their qualifications, we had to create new medical institutes and research centers. Finally, we needed to expand health education, spreading the word about how to ensure a healthy lifestyle and prevent disease. At the same time, we tried to avoid temporary measures as much as possible, and to make our plans future-oriented. We analyzed the experience of the first socialist state, where health protection in its classical form was at the highest level. Senior officials of the Ministry of Health traveled to the Soviet Union on several occasions. In 1953, I spent five weeks in the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic. We studied the working methods of our Soviet colleagues, drew up a plan for further exchanges of delegations to study the experience and agreed on how to develop scientific cooperation in the future. The knowledge and practical experience we gained during these trips, we had to apply and realize in our own conditions. This task required mobilization of all our forces. After all, at that time, the Cold War was becoming more and more acute every year. Acts of sabotage were becoming more frequent, and the poaching of valuable specialists had become a system. Through congresses, meetings, and encounters in clinics, outpatient clinics, at institutes, I got to know many people, the most prominent figures in medicine. Professors Brugsch, Scheunert, Ibrahim, Cax, Zetipim, and Frederick, doctors in the provinces and nurses, as well as workers who, as trade union functionaries, were responsible for health care. I will also never forget those who, together with us, were the first to embark on the path of renewal and new solutions. I recall Professor Walter Friedrich, who in 1950, during the sharpest ideological clashes, supported the peace movement with his scientific and moral authority. In 1962, at the National Congress, reviewing the path he had traveled, he characterized his arrival at real socialist humanism as follows. When I moved from West Germany to Berlin after the end of the war, I was not guided by any political considerations. I moved here because of the extraordinary attention to science and scientific research I became convinced that here scientific research and higher education are fully oriented toward humane goals. From this I subsequently came to realize two truths that I wish to express here, forces oriented towards war and the realization of imperialist claims, unable to lead the nation on the right path, are also unable to open up the prospects of peaceful development for science. All the humanistic aspirations and ideas that have played a role in German history and are inherent in science can only be further realized and developed where the interests of the people, where the pursuit of peace and socialism has become official state policy, namely here in the German Democratic Republic. Many did what Prof. Friedrich did, what he understood, many understood. Our work together has led to clear, convincing results. The spread of tuberculosis has been halted, newborn mortality has been reduced, 30 new clinics and research institutions have been established and four new medical institutes have been established. Year after year, the People's Chamber devoted a quarter of the state budget to the development of socialist health and social security. Well, thanks to everyone's help and assistance, the first legislative acts pertaining to our sphere were prepared and passed. The Labour Law and the Law on the Protection of Maternity and Infancy. 
Now, as we drive through the countryside, we are not only convinced that where there were miserable huts of agricultural workers, there are now clean, homely farmsteads, that the one-classroom village schools have disappeared, and that small plots of land have been merged into vast tracts of agricultural cooperatives. There are now new rural dispensaries and medical stations everywhere, and we are convinced that the legacy of the past has been overcome, that the backwardness of the countryside that existed for hundreds of years has been eliminated in the field of health care. In the city on the Ilm, the market square in front of the Weimar Town Hall on market days presents a cheerful and colourful spectac. Rows of stalls stretch out in a straight line like a string, their canvas roofs mottled with multicoloured, red, white and white blue stripes, all the wealth of bright summer colours, all that the fields and gardens can bestow. Tomatoes flashing in the sun, red, green cucumbers, cast a light yellow early apples and pears, and everywhere flowers, a continuous flower garden. In the afternoon hours, when the tents are already dismantled, all this beauty disappears. There are no more rows stretched out on a string, boxes piled one on top of another or scattered in disorder, scraps of paper and vegetable scraps everywhere. In a few hours the square will be put in full order, everyone knows that, but until this is done, the square is not a suitable place to receive an honourable and welcome guest, and he was retired General Tulpanov. We met him back in the National Committee, then he worked in the Soviet military administration in Berlin Karlshorst. Now he is again a professor in Leningrad. What was to be done? He was standing in the square, obviously with his wife. I quickly ran downstairs to invite the guests into the house. But we did not confine ourselves to a firm handshake on the square, which had not been cleaned up at the end of market day. A lively conversation ensued. Ilpenov had not been in Weimar for several years, and he noticed that there were still some undeveloped plots of land, but now there were squares, lots of flowers and masts with flags. Question after question came, and we talked loudly and cheerfully, our voices echoing off the walls of the town hall and Luca Cranach's house. A few days earlier I had welcomed a visitor from Odessa, Newdorf, a former senior lieutenant. Then came Professor Braginsky from Moscow. In the spring I was visited by Korolkov, chairman of the Society of Hunters of the USSR. It was a meeting with old friend. From 1945 to 1948, three years in a row, we saw each other almost every week to discuss issues related to my work. I was always sure that I could count on his support, whether it was that he helped me to promote an important event out of turn, or that we borrowed a Soviet caterpillar tractor for forest plantation work. Not surprisingly, during our trip to Erfur, we indulged in memories of the first difficult times of construction how I travelled around the individual lands to collect purebred seeds that we wanted to exchange for breeding cattle from the western zones, how I had a row with farmers in Caltenotime, who had deliberately brought an inferior cow to the exhibition of achievements because they feared that the milk supply rates would be raised on the spot, about how after the departure of the specialist who took away with him the latest vaccine cultures, we hastily produced serum against foot and mouth disease and achieved by 1948, that the episiotic episiotic that was rampant in West Germany had not spread to our territory. And now we were looking around the huge exhibition area, shining with all the splendour of early spring, empty culture and seed business in agricultural cooperatives, people's estates, enterprises with state participation, that is, in organisations of any form of ownership, have reached such a high level of development, which can only dream of, frankly admitted Korolkov. But he was interested not only in the exhibits, the fruits of a well-thought-out system of crop production. He was even more attracted by the people, the new generation of young specialists educated in our schools. In their work they wisely combined the experience of old agronomists with the achievements of modern science. Yes, it was worth the effort then. In this form Korolkov summarised his thoughts. Their cloth had a comprehensive meaning, implied many things. The struggle for each person, the fight against mistrust, prejudice, cowardice, against the hostile intrigues of opponents, the struggle with their own internal resistance, when you had to constantly make a distinction between the Nazis and the Germans, when you had to give up to immediately take a direct part in the reconstruction of his homeland and for many years separated from his family. Weimar receives hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, people from all continents, from east and west, scientists and writers meet here at congresses, musicians and teachers of higher education, at international seminars to raise their qualifications. 
Tourists visit the tradition-rich centres of German culture in its former heyday, but they all get acquainted with the new Wiem, with the construction of the socialist city. In this city, I held the post of Oberbürgermeister from 1960 to 1969. An American-German professor who had come from the United States with his students. Young Frenchmen from the Nord department. They all asked questions, listened and looked around. I noticed that the attention of the visitors was attracted by the old engravings on the walls of our room, as well as by a silver relief with a view of old Moscow. I had bought it in an antique store in the Soviet capital. Yes, I said. This engraving, depicting a house in Goethe's garden, is now a special rarity, because the cliché died in a fire in Berlin in 1945. And these geographical maps of Henneberg County, North Africa and Japan are from the 16th and 18th centuries. Medieval maps are extremely interesting from a historical and cultural point of view. You do not see the north at the top, as you are used to seeing on modern maps, so it is difficult to make sense of this map. It requires a different reference point. The young American student was looking at this map, where the north-south direction is different than it is today. Then he looked at me again. Apparently he was pondering my words that another landmark is required. Everything he had seen and heard here was in sharp contrast to what he had learned and heard in his homeland about our socialist republic. He was clearly puzzled, even alarmed. How many people have experienced the same feeling? The acquaintance with Weimar made many people overcome their dislike of communism and try to understand better what the hitherto unknown and slandered world of socialism really is. From this point of view, getting to know Weimar was perhaps more fruitful than any other German city. Here in this city, in its scientific centres, which have accumulated enormous historical experience, the humanist heritage is stored and enriched, which has become a common heritage, a common property. Here our obligations to the past have merged with those symbolised by the monument on Ettersburg Mountain with the Buchanwald Oath, the call to fight against fascism and war, for peace and friendship between peoples. Everything that appears before the visitor here in Weimar is in close, unbreakable connection with the paths travelled by our people in the centuries before our days, up to today's great achievements, when, as a result of collective efforts, our fatherland became a stronghold of peace and socialism. In this our city sees its national and international mission. It is a joy to know that we have contributed to such. Every year I have had to participate in countless conversations at conferences, at meetings, at seminars and workshops. They are truly countless. But from time to time there have been particularly important and memorable meetings for me, for they have made me look back again at the path I have travelled. It was the path of a man who in 1918 said, never again, and then forgot his words, tried to displace from his consciousness these words so important to him at that time. Now the same man said a second time, never again, and this time he remained faithful to his decision. He steadily followed the road that not only made it possible for one man to realise in practice the slogan, never again, but also turned this slogan into the decision of the people, into the policy of the state. I travelled this road to socialism as a Christian, shoulder to shoulder with my fellow believers and with my atheist friends. These twenty-five years of decisive importance for our future, these years of fruitful creative activity, come alive in my memory in all their diversity when I meet German or Soviet comrades in arms in the National Committee. And just as vividly the past appeared before my mental gaze when the chairman of the City Council of the Heroic Volgrad visited Weimar a few years ago. At that time I accompanied my friend Dinkin on a trip to Buchenwald, as did many other guests of our city. A young woman participated in the trip as an interpreter. Only later we learned that she had lost her parents as a child. Together with her entire family, they perished in the Nazi torture chambers. None of us had any idea how much effort it took for her to translate the guide's explanations in front of the gas ovens. We were all depressed, shocked and excited after seeing Buchenwald. We wanted to recover at least a little. So we walked from the monuments to Ernst Thälmann and Rudolf Breitscheid to the Buchenwald Memorial. And here we were inside the tower, in a huge hall, the vaults of which seemed to go upwards, into the infinity. The bell rattled and rumbled. Everyone's gaze is fixed on the giant copper bowl with the earth collected from all the concentration camps. In front of us is a symbol of a Europe that has expired and yet is not broken. A symbolic reminder of the unbreakable obligations embodied in the Buchanwald Oath. Someone quietly, hesitantly asks a question. 
one, another, then there is silence again. I am asked to say a few words. The interpreters translate each to his own group. The young interpreter standing next to me, the one who at first was unable to say a word, overcomes her excitement, makes an effort and repeats in Russian everything I said in a breathless voice. Each word is given to her with difficulty. This is noticed by our friend Volsanin. He realizes what a shock it is for her and takes her under his arm so that she can lean on him. And she continues to translate, doing her duty to the end. Then her face begins to twitch. She trembles, barely holding back her tears. It seems to me as if this fragile creature is now mentally going through the martyrdom of her father, mother, brothers, sisters, friends and relatives, nameless victims and victims named in the lists. She walks through gates and corridors where her heart shrinks with fear. She walks on stone slabs and cobblestone pavement. She walks again and again to the square where the roll call of the doomed prisoners took place, where the ground smelled of human sweat and blood. She walks on until the moment comes, when it is necessary to break the barbed wire by force of will, to overcome the agony of mental confusion and the unbearable horror of loneliness, to endure to the end the last terrible ordeal preserving courage and not losing presence of mind in the name of one's own human dignity and in the name of everything that gave strength in the hopeless struggle. This young woman stands silently among us in silence, broken only by the rustling of the leaves of the wreaths the rustling of the flowers laid at the memorial. When she begins to translate again, having overcome with words and speech the excitement, devoted to her duty, aware of her responsibility, she again becomes a mediator in the transmission of important thoughts and deep feelings. But now the brass gate opened, as if giving people liberation, sunlight, fresh air and life. We looked into the distance, listening to the call and warning that had just sounded in the Buchanwald toll. In the silence that ensued, someone spoke the words of Johannes R. Therefore the homeland is only truly beautiful, where man has created an order worthy of man. There, between the hills in a light haze over the Ilm Valley, spreads a city where people are writing history anew, creating a new Weimar.